Welcome back, everyone, to episode 116 of the Rudest Wrestling Podcast. I'm Matt Derlin here with national champ, three-time All-American, founder of AWA, Max Askren. Max, what's going on? Not much, man. Back for round two. I didn't didn't have enough butters in the last one. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> how's everything up in Wisconsin? I think I, – are you a Packers fan? I, I – I mean, yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I always tell people that I root for the Packers because if they're not winning, then my friends are unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, I I've never really followed football too closely. It's uh, you know, it's one thing that I'll I'll watch a couple, of, you know, watch a quarter or two, but but not that much. But culturally, for the state of Wisconsin, I mean, that's got to be like it or not. I mean, the Packers oh. are, are driving force in Wisconsin culture, right? Yeah, I mean, they are. And so, actually, we have we have an academy in Green Bay, and so uh, that's actually called Packerland because uh, it's 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 you know I think it's like viewing distance from the stadium, so it's about maybe like whatever three miles away or something like that. So, uh, yeah, it's I mean, the Packers are huge in Wisconsin, and everyone loves the Packers. Go Pack, go! And yeah. I don't know. It's uh, but again, something I don't really follow. But I think it's it's something fascinating whether whether you you're into the NFL or any other professional sport, like it or not. Like when you look at the Packers and they're, I think this is uh, kind of what we're going to touch touch base about at a certain point. Is like the culturally established programs and what they do consistently. It doesn't matter the change of leadership, the change of personnel. They just for for. For whatever it is, they always find a way to to get back to the top, or they're knocking at the door. And so, you know, I look, I look at the Packers, and they had a change of their their head coach a year ago. Yeah. You know, this young guy took over, and there there was some discussion about how he would mesh with Aaron Rodgers because they're pretty much the same age, the head coach and the the quarterback, and yeah, how really they would hard. mesh and how they would grow. And you know, here they are again. You know, after you know one year change or back in the the championship game this week. And so it just, it always amazes me and I'm fascinated about success. I'm not, I love the underdog story, Mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm equally as fascinated as the programs that are able to replicate success and a a chain, a high, achieve a high level of success year in and year out. I I think that process just fascinates me. I, yeah, uh, you know, and I don't know, I can't tell you exactly what it is, especially with the Packers. Um, but I mean, it fascinates me as well. Um, I think the interesting thing with the Packers is the ownership that, you know, it's like one, I mean, with the fans that are committed to it. But I think two, as far as like the players too, like they seem like um, they have a high investment of ownership and pride in 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 what they're doing and in their program. And it's, it's something, I don't know, I forgot, I was reading it like probably a year or two ago. Um, but the amount of people that start their careers and end their careers in Green Bay, like they don't, you know, it's like once they come, they stay and they retire here. It's, it's, uh, that is a pretty amazing thing. So it, it means it's got a high level of, of people wanting to stay here when there might be better opportunities other places. So it's, it's balancing happiness and money and value, you know, feeling, feel, feeling valued is, is probably higher on the scale than being paid more. I think in a lot of senses, like once you get to like, all right, I'm going to make 1.2 million or 1.3 million. You know, it's like, is it worth moving my family? Is it worth being at a program where they're cutthroat and going to get rid of you? I mean, there's there's a lot of different things like that. And yeah, and I think you know, I I think when you're looking at you know the ownership group and the, uh, the personnel that are running the organization, I think there's there's similar things that you look at probably when you're trying to target free agents or drafting guys coming out yeah. of the draft, like you know, hitting on a skill set or identifying certain characteristics that are going to fit your organization. And I, and I think there's college programs. They, they do similar things Yes. Um, about what, what's important to the guy, you know, is obviously winning is important to everybody, but as a professional athlete and, and these high level college athletes, like what, what part of an experience are they looking to be a part of? Do they, you know, I, I know some kids and it's a economic reality. I think a lot of kids, yeah. they need money. So scholarship is, is a premium. Other guys are like, no, I want to be a national champ. So how do you put a price tag on being a national champ? Um, would you walk on a place to say I could at the end of four years, be a national champ? Yeah. Like or, hard. Yeah. Or, and the team element of the sport too is like I want to be successful for for myself. I want to be a national champ, but also I want to be part of a, a group as a, a you know a special experience as a as a team. And you know I think you you were able to 
experience a lot of that in your yeah. career, you know, um, from having high level individual success to team success. Um, and it'd be interesting for, for me to get your perspective, like how you, how you rated things. I know people yeah. will say, well, Ben was already at Mi- Missouri uh, when you went there. I know that oh, had to play a factor in the decision, but what were some of the things that you prioritized and, and balanced out when you had to make that decision? Yeah. I mean, for me, that, that was the whole decision, you know? And I mean, not that I, so I, I had five visits set up cause I was like, Hey, like, you know, it's like, I, I really should be looking at things. And so I had, uh, my old club coach was Troy Steiner, who I loved. Um, incredible influence still to this day. I still see him. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, he's at Fresno State. I'm, I'm wishing him big things. Um, but uh, but yeah, so it's like him. He was at Iowa. He just moved. Like, so he's my club coach in my junior year in high school. Um, and so I was looking at there. I was looking at Lehigh. I looked at Columbia in New York City. So I, I love languages. So I speak. Uh, my, my major in college is Russian, French, Japanese. Um, and then I picked up Spanish on the side. Um, but so it was like, all right, the culture of Mecca and great school. Um, and then I had Iowa state right after, uh, so I was, I was their number one choice right after, uh, Kale won a national title. And so I was like, all right, well, where, where do I go? Any of those places or, or Missouri? And, um, you know, it's like ultimately, you know, it's like, it's like trust, loyalty and understanding that you, you know, you're headed in the right direction. Um, and I think that's a big part of it, you know? So for me, it was like, there's, there's nothing that was a bigger factor than, than having my brother there, the number one recruiting, recruiting, uh, group or the number one recruiting class for that year was Kale State. You know, actually, it was really Bobby Douglas's before, you know, he got he got ousted. Um, but you know, it was it was, it was like Gallic, Mitch uh, Mitch Mueller. Um, there was Zabriskie. There were, there would have been myself. There, were, I mean, there's so many guys that were so good. Oh, there's Fanthorpe. Um, there's so so many good guys um, that it's like where where do you draw that line? I think one thing that's really interesting though with with some of the programs is some of them look at short term success and some like their actions lead themselves more to short-term success versus the long-term success, you know? And I, and I think that's actually something that I was, it was interested in bringing up though, but uh, you know, it's like with like Penn state sitting some guys, I think that, that, that is a ploy to have long-term success is taking care of your guys right now, not winning the dual meet right now, but, but you know, it's like, but taking care of your guys right now, because no matter what, even if you're successful, you're going to have your ups and downs. You know, and I, and I think that's something that you were kind of talking about too. It's like you you like the people that are successful year in and year out, and, and myself included. But it's also interesting to see like when you talk about like underdogs, I think that a lot of underdogs, you know, it's like a lot of times it's only a surprise to the other people. They've had tons and tons yes. of preparation. I mean, there are there are the one time instances where somebody upsets somebody and it's amazing performance and it's one time and they can't they can't replicate it. Um, you know, which you've seen a couple guys that get the NCAA tournament, but I think a lot of times there's underdogs that have been building for years and it, it finally comes to a culmination and that's their breakthrough. I think those those underdogs to me are really fun um, because it's what what did they do to change the culture, not what did they do to maintain it. I think both of them are equally interesting questions. So. Yeah, and I think if you you start jumping into this weekend, and you know th- this was obviously an interesting weekend because Fun pretty weekend. much every everybody jumped into their conference schedules. You yeah, know, everybody's out of conference schedules are complete. Everybody's you know in season tournaments are done, and everybody jumped into the heart of their 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 uh, conference schedules. So there was a lot of a huge number of, you know, great results over the weekend. But, you know, I think we want to stay on this theme of, of culture and building and what it takes to, to win a team title. I think that's what everybody's talking about, about Iowa right now. Yeah. It's seemingly. <laughs> They're they, not making much of a conversation. <laughs> they, they, they aren't right. And yeah. I think it's up to us to create a conversation because yeah. right now it's looking like this is the, this is the team to be this it's their team title to lose. But, you know, on the surface, you look at their guys twenty five to to uh, two eighty five. They don't really have a glaring weakness after pulling Assad and shoring up some things. I mean, all of their guys are. I think their lowest ranked guy right now is is seven. Yeah, but that that doesn't include Assad, who I'm thinking is going to be firmly inside the top ten. I don't need I, know if he'll be in the top eight, but he's definitely going to be in the top ten after this weekend. Yeah, I, I mean, I think per- performance is warranted. I think it's more so the longevity of his performances. You know, he's had a couple earlier opens where he's had some losses that maybe weren't top 10 worthy. Right. But. So I think we're, we're looking at Iowa right now and they're, you know, 
I think at this point we could probably say they're prohibitive favorites for the title right now. I know we still have a lot of wrestling going on, but you know, for you looking at the results from the outside, looking in, what is the biggest factor to them turning the page from a team that was on the outside looking, looking in for kind of the last decade, the last decade, they, they haven't won a team title. So what's different about this year's group? I mean, I think that's that's something that will go kind of kind of volley back and forth. But I think that the most interesting thing to me is they've always been able to put a high output as far as work, but they weren't willing to wrestle in all positions. They were selective, you know. And it's like I remember like the old adage, just like you know, it's like you know, it's like shoot, finish, clean. Um, but then they found themselves shooting and they couldn't finish clean. So then it more became you can't shoot, you know. Um, so I, I think I think those I think I think that it's like when you when you're not willing to wrestle in every single position, it makes having a high output of work really really hard. I mean, do you, do you think that plays into it? Do you think that's all of it, or do you think because because I think if you're willing to put in the most work, it makes it makes it so you're able to separate that gap. If you're not, and there's places where people can wrestle, I think it really allows people to exploit those. Yeah, I think there, there there's a fine line between putting in the effort and putting in the work in specific areas to your point. I think Iowa always worked hard and wrestled hard, but I think they were deficient in a couple of areas. And when you're, de- when you know you're deficient, when you know you're deficient, it puts a little chink in the armor. So you're not, you know, so you don't have as much confidence in putting yourself in every situation. And, and to your point, wrestling through every situation. And on top of that, having the, confidence to convert in every situation. I think that's what we're seeing with the Iowa Hawkeyes right now across the board, like all three areas, you know, top, bottom, you know, on your feet, everywhere, you know, they're, they're attacking. And I I don't want to say it's with reckless abandon, but they're attacking with a level of belief that they think good things are going to happen no matter what situation they put themselves in. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say it's, it's, it's like some of the best guys when you're sitting there and you're like, if and so I always tell this to my guys because uh, you know there's people like you know it's like I was talking to Jaden Cox and I remember him being really frustrated after his Rio performance and he took third and third third at the Olympics and he came back and he's like he was so frustrated that people weren't excited to wrestle him and they didn't open up against them but you know it's like you're talking to me you're like hey Jaden like if they have ten exchanges with you they're losing nine. <laughs> what right. opportunity do they have, right? If if they make it so there's only one cha- exchange and they have they have a ten percent chance, they still have a chance. You know, and so I think it's the opposite of that side, where it's like you'll get those guys that are high output people. And if they have 10 exchanges and nine of them, they're going to win. The more exchanges they put themselves in, the better it's going to be. And I think that's one thing that Iowa is doing right now is they're making it 10 exchanges, 12 exchanges, 13 exchanges. So the higher the amount of exchanges, the better their chances, the better the likelihood that they'll come out on top. You know, even if you have an anomaly where they lose three out of the 10, you're still winning seven. Yeah, I agree. And I think the other thing is, you know, on one side, I think there, there, there might be some skeptics with Iowa. Number one, saying, well, they haven't won in a decade. Can they continue this up? Can, you, can they continue to sustain this level of performance for another two, two and a half months after they've already established it in the first eight weeks of the season about where, where they're at? You know, for me, I kind of side on to, I think momentum's, momentum's, a very scary thing. Yeah. Once you establish momentum, once guys, and I think momentum is feeding on a level of belief and making that level of belief contagious to the whole group, not to just one or two guys, yeah. but all 10 guys. And beyond those 10 guys, it's it's obviously everything that's going on in the room, not just the 10 guys, but the 30, 40 guys, what their attitudes are yeah. every day when they come in the room, the consistency of a message. And then the belief of buying into that and sustaining that level of belief one through 10. And right now it's looking like I don't see him slowing down. If anything, I see this contagious feeling that you're getting. And once you get that feeling as a group, yeah. you want more and more of that. Oh, and yeah. I just see it continuing to build up over the, the next two months. Could things happen, you know, injuries or anything, but it seems like the coaching staff has a really good pulse on what this team is made up how they're wired, you know, what their touching points are, is what, you know, what points they need to touch that on is yeah. from, from a speaking level. And it's just like continuing to build this momentum. I think it's a really scary thing. 
how how do you so i got i got two thoughts here so one how, or how do you take the message that that is being sent um I guess maybe we should do one. How do you take the message being sent of pulling Ava Saad's red shirt? Because in, in, in my perspective, right, that's one of those things that's a short term. To, to me, it's a short term loss. You're going to lose Cash Wilkie. You, I mean, you already have Cash Wilkie and you have brands, right? I mean, who is family? <laughs> so you yeah, got those two guys. Literally, that, right? Exactly. Literally, family. Uh, but you have two really good options at 84 that maybe are bubble like right around top 10, top top 12, top 14. And you got Ava Saad who like – I think has probably a higher upswing um, for this year of the possibility of him scoring more points, but those guys still have years and he could have a red shirt. But I think it's the interesting thing that it sends that message of, Hey, um, we need people to be performing. We're going to do the best thing that is possible for the team. And I, and I think you see that at all those weights. I mean, shoot at, what was it? 149. You had three guys that were in the top six at Midlands maybe, or it was a two and one lost blood round. But I mean, like, I think that's an interesting message to be sent to the whole team. And it doesn't seem to be a negative. It seems, seems to be a very meritocrat. Uh, like, like it's, it's, it's a meritocracy. Whoever is right. doing the best, whoever's performing, we're going to put in there regardless if we're pulling your red shirt, whatever. But I, I, I wonder if that makes them perform at a higher level. Well, I think it, there's that commonality in the goal, right? Of yeah. We're in it to win it, no matter what this year. And I know what you're saying. Could this be a short-term gain? Yes, making these decisions to to put Assad in there. But, you know, Ben and I were talking about this the, the last couple of weeks about mm-hmm. what should you do? And I'm like, hey, if if I'm the head coach at Iowa, I haven't won a team title in a decade, I'm not going to leave anything up to chance, right? If I can win by... 200 points, you yeah. know, and to, to, to coin the phrase that brands used several years ago, intergalactic domination. If I can go for that type of that type of domination, I'm going to go for it. Right? That's awesome. um, Cause I, I looked at, you know, the projected point differentials in the team rankings a couple of weeks ago. And I think with, before the changes that we saw in Iowa's lineup and Penn state's lineup, I think the projected gap of separation was about 20 to 25 points. Yeah. That's really one, one national champ. Yeah, give or take. Yeah, uh, well, one guy blowing it. You right. Know, like, so I've, I've yeah. had that experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when you when, when you're That's looking so at that numbers, and you know, as a coach, you you you're still projecting out towards March, even though even though coaches tell their athletes live in the moment, wrestle the next match, all the cliches that are out there. Yeah. You know they're thinking in. You're, they're calculating numbers in their head, projecting out towards March. And if I'm Iowa right now, to reestablish their position in the hierarchy of wrestling, which is winning national titles, which they've done as good as anybody in the history of wrestling, yeah. you know, arguably, to get that back on track, I think you have to go all in. I Dude. think, could you have... Do you have three good guys at 49? Yes. Do you have three good guys at 84? But who is the absolute best? And I think that's Assad. And I think you've got to pull all the strings, pull out all the stops to win this first one before you start thinking long-term. I think right now, think of the short-term, whatever it takes to win right now, and then think about the future after after March. That So that that leads you to your next thing. Do you think they'll pull Ironman's red shirt too? Without a doubt. I think that's coming. I think that's coming, think that's coming this week. Oh man. Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're going if you're going to this extent, right? Yeah. If 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 you're pulling a sod, if you're making those tough strategic uh lineup moves, if if you're if you've made those first two steps, go all the way in and, and pull Ironman. Yeah, I so I do understand what you're saying. The one thing that's really interesting to me is like you got Murin, who is a junior or senior. I you know? think he's a junior. I think, I he's, think he's a junior. I'm saying I think he's a junior too. But like you got you got Muren who's been, you know, I guess like this is the one thing that I see is like um I, I love that Iowa has that loyalty factor to it, right? But they usually they're they're very unabashedly like they're like, all right, our guys like will put in Abasad over our other two guys, but Abasad is a committed Hawkeye. And then you got, you know, you got the Ironman who, you know, is kind of a I don't want to say a mercenary, but he's kind of a mercenary this year. You know, it's like he came from Missouri. He, you know, it's like he made a choice to to change over for his his later career of freestyle, I think. But now you're going to put him in like a place and take out one of your own that's been putting in the time. Does that, does that have a positive effect or a negative effect on the team outlook? 
You know, I, I think it's it's all about the message you're, you're preaching to the team and yeah. how everybody's buying into the message on the team. Because, you know, historically, if you look back on the teams in the last 15, 20 years that have won team titles, you know, you look at you look back at when Iowa won their four straight. Yeah. And a lot of people would say they did that. They combined Virginia Tech and they combined same, Iowa. Same right? thing with Penn State. Same thing with Penn State. When we won, you yeah. know, I was a part of the, the 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 year they won their first national title. What did we do? We got Andrew Long as a mid year transfer, and Andrew Long was a tipping tipping point for us winning a national title. Literally, but, literally, yeah, li- literally. literally. Um, but I think if you you see a lot of the teams that have won team titles, they've they've had. I hate to call him a mercenary. Yeah. You know, like Ironman, because I I was kind of pretty hard on Ironman when he transferred. Yeah, but I, I, I don't think it's. I'm sorry. But he's made his choice, right? So yeah. he is a Hawkeye. Right. I don't care if he's, a, you know, my position, if, you, if you're here a day or five years, you're a Hawkeye, you're a Tiger, you're a Buckeye. You're those, you're those colors as soon as you walk in the door. I, I understand from your perspective. I understand from my perspective. I'm talking about from a team culture perspective that like, you know, it's like, it's like everything. I mean, that's why we have, you know, that's why it's why bullying and hazing is a thing is because like, it's like, we, we want to make sure that you are committed to us. Like, yeah, you just change over, but you were there for four years. What happens if this next year you decide Penn state's the better move for you? Or are you going to move there too? And so I think there's definitely a period of that. And I don't know, I don't know where it is. Um, but you know, there's a period of that. I think the team aspect would be longer for them to integrate than it would be for a coaching or a fan standpoint. For me, it's like, yeah, he's a, he's a Hawkeye. I agree with you. But as far as like the teams committed, you know, it's like, are, are they like, oh man, that's messed up. Like one of our own that's been putting in the grind in with us for, you know, going on his fourth year, you know, now, now he's going to be replaced. Yeah. And I think this all comes back to, this is where so many people think coaching talent is the easiest thing in the world. So and I think it's, it's much different. It's yeah. much more difficult than having a group of guys that you have to build up and, and get to buy into a dream. Yeah. All these guys are coming to Iowa with expectations. And when you have an overabundance and I, it's not overabundance, you have to accumulate depth and talent and you have to recruit on top of, on top of guys you know, it's really difficult when you have this great collection of talent. And I think that's what's been so amazing about Penn State, yeah. that they've had such sustained success with so much talent and levels of talent at each weight class that they've been able to do it. Seemingly, we've never heard we've never heard anybody from their camp like complaining or speaking out of turn or or, or bitching about it yeah. should have been me. I should have been the guy. But no, they they've done such a good job of like keeping everybody galvanized on board with the same mission all the time. And I think that's what we're seeing out of Iowa right now. We're not seeing these guys at, at 184 say yeah. anything. We're not, we're not seeing anybody. There's, there's been no change at 141 yet, but I don't see anything coming out if, if Ironman jumps in there. And I think that speaks to, you know, the strength of the message that they're, they're sending and the culture that they've established there in Iowa this year. Yeah. Well, they're doing a great job. I mean, it leads you into the dual results. I mean, they blanked two great teams this weekend. <laughs> yeah, geez. Like I was I was actually just talking to Reader a little bit this morning. All right. And I was like, hey man, good recovery, you know, after the Minnesota match, you know, good recovery against Nebraska yesterday. It's like, yep. Yeah. And for that we get Ohio State this week. <laughs> Yeah. It's just like, welcome to the Big Ten. You know, yeah. can any conference just like harden you up and battle test you better yeah. than this conference? And you just like, oh, we wrestled two top ten guys, two two top tens this week. We got another top ten next week. This is just, yeah. this is what it is, right? It's pretty amazing. I mean, yeah, that's it. and so I, you know, I, I go back and forth with different times. Sometimes I think it's a benefit um, to see that level of competition to be hardened. And other times I'm like, man, it's like, oh, I mean, you see it with Penn State. They're opting out. You know, they right. opt, they opt, they opt their guys out. So they're not wrestling two times a week, three, three times in two weeks, whatever, against some of the best competition. And I, I kind of, you know, you wonder if that's the right move. I, I would say it definitely seems like it would be. I don't think kids need, you know, it's like 40 really, really, really tough, tough uh, matches in one season. And it seems to me what Penn State is doing. And, and I don't think we really need to jump into, you know, the, particulars of the Iowa versus Penn or Purdue and Indiana, they blanked them against two good teams. I mean, 
Purdue's a top 10 team yeah. and they blanked them. I yeah. mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, there really wasn't much to talk about, but no. getting over to, to Penn state, you know, I think there's been a lot of criticism and number one, you know, Ben and I talk about this all the time, have talked about it all the time. Like, Kale obviously doesn't care what anybody else thinks. So get over it. Yeah. You know, my thing is like, people are like, well, they should wrestle more or they haven't wrestled a dual meet at home in over a month. And then we should, he doesn't care. He, no. He's only committed to his staff, his team, his recruits and doing whatever it takes. Yeah. Regardless, like he doesn't listen to the noise. So people are talking, he doesn't care. Like obviously, you know, going in, heading into this year, we saw that he was with certain guys. He was going to try and balance, you know, winning an NCAA title with putting guys in the Olympic trials and, and making the Olympic teams. Things have gone off track a little bit with Kassar getting injured, yeah. but it, it definitely appears right now there isn't that much concern with dual meets. It's all about what do we have to do with certain individuals to get them to the point where they can perform to win a team title. Yeah. Um, and we're still seeing him hold guys out. We saw Rashid in the lineup this time for the first year in over a year um, mm -hmm. since he's had his surgery. Um, I don't know what you think about the additions with – it's been finally announced this past week that Connell is out for the year. Yeah. Kassar is out for the year. So the next two guys up are going to be Rashid and then uh, Seth Nevels. I, I mean, I just feel bad. You know, same thing. I actually, the guy that I wrestled in the NCAA finals, Kirk Smith, you know, it's like to get injured your senior year and that sucks. <laughs> That's yeah. another other way about it. It sucks. And so both those guys think they're senior years and, you know, it's like, I don't know if they've wrestled enough to be another medical or it's like, if you want to continue to stay in college, but man, that's, that's, that's tough. But, um, it's interesting to me that, you know, it's like that, that we get so worried about that. And I think as fans and as people that are watching it from like the outside in, um, it's funny that you, you know, it's like, you think of it like, oh, they left so many points on the board. They're not wrestling this guy and that guy. But I also feel like, um, it's got a benefit of they're getting those backups experience. They're getting those backups experience. They're getting them, you know, it's like really good matches and they're balancing that too with keeping their other guys healthy, keeping their other guys, you know, it's like not having to make weight 30 times in one season. I think all those have different, different benefits to them. And I think the only negative that I can see is that the fans suffer, <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. know, it's like, whereas yeah. like if you're a coach, like you're saying, Kale doesn't care. Not, not one damn bit, you know, or, or the whole Penn state group doesn't care one bit. So yeah, get over it. And, you know, I think that's fine. You yeah. know, I think, you know, in, you know, a culture and social media where information is accessible for everyone, I think everybody is like, we demand this. We are, we're owed this. And, you know, the thing that I've said with, with, with Kale, like, no, he only owes Penn State and Penn State wrestling. He doesn't owe anybody else anything, yeah. whether you like it or not. Um, and that's why he, keeps things close to the vest and he keeps things in house. But obviously, you know, going back a little bit in our conversation, I think those are important things to, when you keep everything in house, culturally, you, you've got a pretty sound found foundation. If you, you don't got guys talking out of turn on social media or saying things to the media, like there's, there's a method to this, the way they control their flow of information. And I think it's, it's critical to their culture. I, I mean, yeah, 100 percent, you know, and I think it also allows them to do something that you see a lot. You know, it's like not only in their wrestling, but I guess also in this sense is that um, they're willing to make mistakes. You know, they're 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 willing as a coaching staff to make mistakes and make adjustments and, and, and move forward. Um, and I think that's like part of like, all right, what what is the right amount of you know, matches for a kid to have? What's the right amount of matches for somebody to weigh in? What's the what's the amount of time to let somebody heal before you bring them back in? Like with Shakur Rashid. I'm sure they could have put him in earlier, you know, but I mean, he literally hasn't wrestled. I don't think he's wrestled any opens. I think this is his first dual meet. Um, so that, that to me is, uh, it, it's, it's interesting and it's refreshing. Um, and it's something that, that again, I think a lot of coaches would err on the side, like you're talking about, like they're kind of a little bit paranoid, like, Hey, if we can do this, let's, let's bring our full might and make sure that we don't, don't give up any, you know, letdowns. Um, and they're kind of, they're, they're on the other end of the, end of the spectrum. They're like, well, maybe we could do it. Like, let's see what's the best thing for the kid. 
Yeah, and I think this year more than more than in past years, it's all about developing the individual. If you're Penn yeah. State, yeah, I mean it's it's and we've we've talked about them developing guys overall. I think this is if they manage to win a title, which doesn't seem likely. I know a lot of people are saying that. I don't think they're that far off. I don't like, think they're I'm, far I'm, off. I'm of the like, like number one, like when you've won that much for so long, like show that you can knock off the champ. I know that I was favored, but until they actually do it, and this is why I think they should go all in uh, on, on their roster choices. But, you know, Penn State has shown the ability and the capacity to get guys ready in March and perform at the highest levels. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people looking at the Rashid performance over this weekend, he didn't look good at all. Yeah. Like, but he found a way to win, which is something something to be said. And I think getting that fight back, getting in the mix where you got to really dig down deep when you're not at your best. And he obviously wasn't at his best yet, but I think this is the time that the coaching staff said, okay, I think two months is probably the perfect amount of time to get you peaked and ready to perform yeah. at the NSA tournament. We're going to pull the trigger trigger now, regardless of the outcome, because he, he very easily could have lost both matches. And he was on on the ropes. He, he did win. He did lose one. He lost. Lost to Davison. He, he, yeah, um, he's but a good I think. Year. He's, but I, he's having a really good year. But I think this is one one of those decisions where Penn State's willing to live with that. Okay, you yeah. lost a match. No big deal. I don't care. Like it's about getting getting better. Like this isn't going to affect us. This isn't going to affect the end of the year. We're just we need to get you back in there, and we're willing to live with the results. Um, Come what may in in March, so all right. Let let me ask you a question. This is the last one. Well, you know, or whatever. I guess you can keep talking more. But um, is it? And so this is kind of a joke, but also not. Is Penn State <laughs> too laid back to have somebody that's successful at one twenty five in the last? You know, since since Nico. But it's like I feel like like one twenty fivers are usually pretty high strung. You know, and I, I feel like they're just so laid back that maybe it's like everyone's like, oh, man, I can't work under this this circumstance. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's we've talked about it previously, and I think. I think they're still recovering, whether people like it or not, like they're still recovering from Suriano. Like when you're when you're recruiting guys, especially a guy that you think is going to be the difference maker for four or five years, that this is the guy that you see where where in your singlet and he's such a notable recruit yeah. that as soon as he made his commitment, as soon as Suriano made his commitment, I think a lot of guys, a lot of underclassmen started thinking elsewhere automatically. They're like, well, I don't have a place at yeah. Penn State. I better start looking at other programs, getting exposed to other programs. And so when he left, I think that was a blow that they, they still haven't recovered. You just don't lose a guy like that. It's very hard, and I think what most people don't understand is Penn State has such an embarrassment of riches at other weight classes, but I think it's it's easier to accumulate talent at the middle weights or throughout the lineup as opposed to getting that high-end sustainable talent at heavyweight and at 125. I think if you ask most college coaches, those are probably the two hardest weight classes to fill – over four a four year time frame, just because most twenty five pounders grow out of the weight classes. Typically, yeah. it's yeah. really hard to find a five year twenty five pounder, and most big guys that are athletic and can and are high level athletes they play football. So it's hard to find a it's hard to find a, a really good heavyweight. So you take um, those short ninety sevens and and bulk them up. Exactly. So I think when you when you lose a guy like Soriano, like I think that's an easy thing to say, but I think there's longer lasting effects that people hmm. don't give it credit for. Interesting. What what kind of longer lasting effects? I just think you look at at Teasdale then Teasdale committed, but I yeah. I don't think if you if you press the Penn State guys, I don't think they ever thought Teasdale was going to be a twenty five pounder, right, which yeah. he's obviously not. No. Um, so you can, I think a lot of people are looking. It's like well, you lost Suriano and then you lost Teasdale. I'm like, well, Teasdale was never part of that equation anyways. I think he was more slotted in at 33, 41. Yeah. So they just haven't found that guy. Um, they lost – and then they lost somebody Teske. to transfer. They just Teske lost Teske. as well. Yeah. Right? 
so you got something's got to be going on there, and and we don't know, but I 20, think it's just a hard yeah. it's a hard thing. Twenty five seems like a different formula, you know. And there's some coaches that like really have a good handle for it. Like I think uh, I don't know, and I would say like back in the day, like I remember one of the people I was like, oh man, like you're really good coaching there is uh, uh, Mike Mena. You know, he had a really good run between Joe Dubuque and between Angel Escobedo at at uh, Indiana. And there's some coaches yep. that, you know, it's like Glenn Wall to that. But I, I think it is kind of a, like you're saying, heavyweight 125 are definitely a different uh, different fit. Because you also have like Minnesota that had a string of heavyweights for however long. Um, so it's, yeah. And I mean, they're still sustaining it. Yeah. Steve, I mean, Steve, I mean it, yeah. It's, I mean, I mean you, look at, you look at 25 pounds, you got to say I was probably, you know, if you look at from a program history, Iowa, yeah. Okie State always seemed to have lightweight guys for whatever reason. And – I don't want to excuse this, but being being in coaching for as long as I was, for whatever reason, there just seems to be gaps. Like, and I get it; they should. I I, I think with Penn State, like, can you get a twenty five pounder? It's been four years now. Damn. Can you get a twenty five pounder? Where it just seems other years, it's just like you just keep producing talent. You know, yeah. year after year after year. I I don't know. I just yeah. it's one of those things that I scratch my head at. I'm like. As a coach, like how the heck I know at one of the programs I was at, how the heck can you not get a ninety-seven pounder? You know, it seemed like yeah. every year, like we couldn't find an answer at one ninety-seven. And I'm like, it's not like they're not recruiting it. Yeah, you know, they're, they're definitely recruiting it. It's not like, oh, Penn State just can't have twenty-five pounders, so we're just not even going to recruit on it. I mean, yeah. they're obviously doing the work. They they just haven't hit on a guy. And sometimes it's an easy things to to say, but sometimes it's as simple as that. You just don't land the guys that, that produce. Yeah. Or, you know, you don't, you know, it's like you kind of get lucky having the guys that have the right mentality that end up developing. And, and I think that's a tough thing too. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely, I think that's the hardest part about coaching college is, is, is developing a relationship with the kids and finding how their mindset is and their mentality is going forward. You know, it's like, you've been around, you know, it's like you're seeing them at a tournament and you like how they compete and you talk to them parents a couple of times and you talk to their, their, uh, them. And, you know, it's like, that's about it. That's all you get. And then you're like, all right, well, why don't you come, come join us? But you don't really know how they think, you know, what turns them on. And I think, uh, I think that's a tough part about being a college coach. No, without a doubt. Yeah. So it seems like this episode, Max, we're, we're, <laughs> we're on to more topical things. We're talking about bad. topics. As, as that. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Um, I think this is all good. I think this is as, as important as the, as the results itself, because these are all things that go into high level success. I think these are things that outside the results itself, these are things that coaching staff, when they're sitting down today after two tough dual meets, I'm like, where do we need to be? Where can we shore up, you know, culturally, foundationally, you know, uh, what is our message on point? Are we sending the right message? Do we need to tweak the message? Because these are all the things that you're trying to, as you're looking into, you know, here in the next, once we turn the page, from January into February, as a coaching staff, you're starting to tr- transition into the peaking phase of the season, and you're starting to to run downhill. We're getting to that point really quickly, where there's still, you know, there's still a lot of time on the clock. We still have about two months left in the season, but yeah. two months is not that that long. So it's all, you know, that's where, you know, not giving in to a lot of pressures as a coaching staff. This is the time of year where coaching staff start feeling the pressure, you know, results start mattering where, where you're sitting at, you know, projecting out how many qualifiers you're going to have potential all American uh, Americans point scores, all those things that you want to keep removed from your team. You don't want to exert that pressure and lay that pressure on the guys in the team because they're, yeah. they're already feeling it. Yeah. But the things that the conversations that you're having amongst your coaching staff, you know, that you don't, there's a lot of concerns from a lot of coaches around the country at this point of year. The, the thing you can't do as a coach is let your your athletes see your stress points, right? Mm-hmm. And I think – I don't know. I'd love to hear – because I don't know this. this I, I don't know Coach Smith that well. Yeah. But obviously he just seems to have that even keel mentality. No matter what happens, good or bad, he just seems to be like this steady influence no matter what. That could be wrong. That's just no, my I, outside perspective. I, I think you're right. I mean, you're t- so you're talking about peaking in the second and a half of the season. So I actually remember that being a conversation 
um, that we had while, while we were, you know, while we were there is like, you know, it's like some years it seems like we competed, we, we peaked a little bit too early. Um, but, you know, I think, I think keeping thing in, things in perspective and I think making sure that we are, we are always focused on the end of the year. You know, we were always focused on developing for the end of the year and making sure performance uh, was the best at that point. And so sometimes I think as coaches, you get a little too excited, too a little revved up, and, and that 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 also kind of then ends up kind of like trickling into the team. Um, so it's like you know, it's, you always have like national duels. For us, that was a huge thing. Um, I mean, like back 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 during our era, um, it was national duels, and everyone would show up there. And so it was like the team title race, and then then you'd later on you'd have that second half of the season that was peaked towards March. Um, but I think, you know, it's like sometimes we revved up a little too much and we were too amped up and too excited. But I think that's like part of part of, you know, it's like as a coach, you say stuff. Then at the same time, too, you have like guys on the team that are like raring and ready to go and that are that, that are that leadership. Um, and so I think making sure you are staying even keeled as a coach, like like Coach Smith, like you're saying, like you did, is you, you couldn't tell what part of the season it really was. Um, you know, based upon his reaction, based upon his demeanor, um, you know, he was, he was always focused on the development towards later on. So we have a big win against a dual meet like ASU beating Penn state. It, it wasn't like they were so pumped and it was like this big elation factor. And then a letdown afterwards, it was, you know, it's like, it was like, all right, well, back, back to work. You know, it's like, we're still, we're still focused on March. And I think that's an important thing to have. And I think that's something you see, um, between a lot of those top level programs is, is, is no dual meet is, um, you know, no dual meet defines you. And I think, I think that's, that's something that's really interesting, you know, cause we always talk about it as far as like competitive factor, you know, it's like you're in a tournament, you up somebody, upset somebody in the semis, you know, it's like, you'll see those guys and the best guys stay even keeled. Like it was their plan all along, then nothing changed. And then they go on, they perform the next match too. And you see those guys that are so psyched and they're flexing and they're all pumped. And then the next match, they look like crap. Um, so I think as far as like a competitor, you have to do that. But I think um, that same skill set needs to be done and you need to kind of manage that from a coaching standpoint. You know, it's like that, that, all right, yeah, we, we won the duel, like back in the room tomorrow, you know, um, not, not, nothing changes that course. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, going back to the, the, the little chat I had with, with John Reeder this morning, I think that's what's impressive to see a, a performance. They they lost to Minnesota on Friday night, Wisconsin yeah. against a, a really good team. I think they were ranked third. Yeah. Um, they lost to Minnesota. They turned around and then beat number two Nebraska. You know, two days later. And I mean, that's what you have to have. You've got to have a resilient team. One one resilience comes from the coaching staff. To your point, the message that you have to set. You got to believe it yourself. Okay, yeah. we, we got beat on Friday night. Hey, let's forget about it. Let's see if we can focus on a few few areas, some a couple points, because we can't go through match by match. It's like oh, we've got to redo something in in twenty four hours. It's like what little corrections did we make? Because yeah. we, they weren't they weren't that far off. Even though they lost the duel meet, they weren't that far off. I really think, you know. Minnesota versus Wisconsin came down to heavyweight. You know, the additional Gable yeah. Stevenson. It was 20 to 14. You take Stevenson out there. There's most likely Trent Hilger gets bonus points and Wisconsin wins that duel. Yeah. So I think it's a it's something like that. You don't want to excuse a loss, but I'm like, hey guys, it was just a takedown here or there. Yeah. If we can, you know, stay focused on the things that that you're focused on in the room every day. I'm I'm sure that's what Boner and Reader were talking about on Saturday in between you know, those tool duels, it's like, Hey, there's nothing new that we need to talk about. We just need to remind you of certain things like, Hey, we got to get back to our finishes or we got to, we got to hustle on bottom or we get, we can't give up easy escapes on bottom. You know, it's, it's usually, you know, the consistency of those talking points, like you said, with coach Smith, like there was a consistent message. There wasn't these outliers of emotion, like what the freak happened last night. We, we suck. We're awful. You guys got to, you know, you know, you guys don't want to win. Yeah. Yeah. Like not, yeah. Not major course corrections. And I think that's right. something you'll see with some of those other, you know, other programs like course corrections with, with like, all right, we, this didn't work. Let's change and go 180 degrees the other way. Um, you know, and that, that's something that again, with the, with those programs, it's like, I think it continues along with the, the things that are preached as competitors and they apply those things to, to coaching. Um, it, it shouldn't be big course corrections. And at the same time too, it's like one pump up 
isn't going to help you for the whole season. It might help you for that one match. Um, but, you know, you need to do things right. And you need to have discipline to build those good habits that will, that will help you later on. So, yeah, like you're saying, on our single leg, you got him up. And, we, you know, so, for instance, like the first match with, with Gross and, uh, and DeSanto, like, all right, you took the shot. You didn't finish that first single leg. Like, let's work on the little details there. And if he takes him down, he rides him out. Like, that's going to be a totally different match. Um, so yeah. it's like, yeah, it's like little, little things that, that play out into bigger, you know, bigger things later on. Yeah. And I think, you know, as a coaching staff, the old win one for the Gipper speech, yeah. you can only go to, you can only go to that. Well, one time, one time. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to do it, it's like, you better save it to the exact yeah. right time. Cause you can't get it back. Yeah. Um, and you know, this goes back to maybe Penn state. I guarantee you those guys the mentality is the same. They still think they're going to win it. Oh yeah. And I think yeah. there's an attitude of belief. And, and that's the thing for, for everyone that's saying, I was got this locked. It's in the bag. It's a done deal. I, I can tell you there's one team for sure. That's not thinking that way. And they think, Hey, we still have two months to figure this out. Are we, are we the best team right now? I think Penn state's willing to say, I think Iowa could yeah, possibly shot. be right now. They could be better. Yeah. But in but in March, you know, if I'm talking to the team every day, I'm like, in March, we've proved nine out of the last 10 years, we are the best team. So there's yeah. no reason. This is a different lineup. We have different st- circumstances. There's some injuries, new faces in the lineup. Doesn't matter, guys. We've shown. You came here with the level of belief. If you come here, you're going to win. It doesn't – hey, I don't care what anybody's saying right now. Yeah. We still have the group – we still have a pr- proven tradition. You keep buying in. You keep believing we will be the team come March. And that's what's going to be, I think, fascinating over the next two months because I think there's so many other narratives that are that, that are about to play out here in the next two months that are going to be really fun and fun to watch on the sideline. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It'll, it'll be fun to see because it's like, again, go out there, perform, and the rest will take care of itself. And I think that's, yeah, it'll be interesting to watch come March. Yeah, for sure. So this is a fun conversation. This is a little different than our normal show. Typically, we get into results. Maybe we can do that tomorrow. Get in more of results on the weekend. But I think this is good. I think this is good context leading up to the next two months. Indeed. Yeah, it's a good good setup. So cool, man. All right, Max. Hey, I appreciate it and look forward to catching up here in the next day or so. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Talk to you. We'll see you.